Hey, Dr. Mike here. This is for my CIS 2640 Network Security, aka Security Plus class. This is topic six, which is uh, at the time of this recording, chapter six in our, in our textbook, um, which goes over network security devices, design, and technology. So, devices technology is very similar. Design is an important aspect we're going to talk about. Um, Again, I'm going to cherry pick these slides here and just show some examples why I think it's some important concepts to come out of this chapter. Uh, again, always look at, um, read through the whole chapter, please, you know, or thumb through it. And um, there's stuff in there that, that will be on quizzes and maybe of importance um, that I might not cover. So, in any case, chapter six, take a look here. Um, Again, we're looking at network devices, how they can be used. Also, architectures itself. This is a pretty important aspect, um, the architecture. Uh, you can buy devices for both security and go back and audit devices. Uh, They're not security-wise, like switches and routers um, and firewalls. You can, audit, up, you, know, you can monitor them, update them, you can reconfigure them. But uh, there's stuff about network security, especially when it comes to architecture, it's pretty important to have that built in and early on. So first off, uh, the chapter talks about the OSI model. And um, the OSI model itself, I'm gonna try this out here, so I can look up. The OSI model itself uh, is a great place to start when looking at security. Uh, and more than, than just for network-wise, I mean, really, um, just in security in general. I think from physical, right? So here we can see our physical layer. Well, think of physical security, right? You know, so we have the best server in the world. It's hardened. It's uh, patched, monitored, but it's in a it's in a closet that. No one has key. No one, you know, it's just an unlocked closet. Or who has the keys to the, to the server room? Who, who has access to those keys and so on? So you know, data link. That too, right? Is our how's our wiring look itself? Our network wiring, our packets, all that stuff. How's that being sent around? Um, as you move up the stack here, you come from looking at the physical security of the device to how it's connected, and not just connected in forms of malicious, but also do we have backup networks? Do we have a failover? Um, don't forget, a big part of security is not just can I defend myself, be resilient um, from a hacker, can I be resilient from any forms of risk? So, especially high levels of risk. And so, you know, our network configurations like that, and then we look at our, you know, are we using TLS, right? When we get into here, our transport, are we using, you know, um, transport layer security, HTTPS, SSH, um, you know, as our, our MIME transports, all kinds of stuff, uh, FTP secure, uh, how those look on, uh, actually look out there on the network too when they're being looked and exposed. How can we see this? Um, is it, you know, is it fully mappable from external or not? So again, our data most important, right? How are we protecting our data? Uh, you know, so we saw before and previous one, how we handle sessions. Um, it's an in-house communication. How's our session management handled? So is it being uh, properly um, done where we can't get any horizontal or uh, um, vertical escalation attacks? So up the chain here, these last two, application, code. How's the code of our application? Does the code go through any kind of validation process? So, I mean, this model, you could take this and really stretch it out and look at a security stack, not just from the network, in all aspects. So, um, so in case, uh, keep that in mind, it's a great way to, to approach this. Uh, this talks about it more on the network side, <laughs> but, I like to bring it to bring it to you as look at this from a model for cybersecurity in general and resiliency. So um, devices. 
so we have tons of kinds of devices in the network and really um, what are we doing with these devices you know are our bridges first off what are the devices what are they understand what they are um, where they operate on that stack are they layer two are they layer three are they multi-layer devices uh, switches is probably going to be the first thing that's really going to come to mind. Um, hubs, I mean, sites maybe for very small homegrown networks. Um, hubs, of course, we know are not very scalable. They're not managed, um, and really, they can just they don't you know they become really an issue upon larger implementations of hubs. But switches, which you can buy now, are like super cheap little man managed unmanaged switches. So when it comes to Larger corporations, large institutions, you probably have managed switches. Um, how they manage. So I'm going to talk about how a switch works. I'm only going to be breeze over these. But understand that's probably going to be your main stops for uh, looking at security auditing and security of a network. Um, same with your router also. So our next thing is our router. And not just your network. Think of the cloud too. That's where this last one comes in. Load balancers. Uh, load balancers are very critical for the availability part. Remember our CIA? Um, not the CIA as in you know, the uh, people in Langley, Virginia. I'm talking about CIA confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Availability, load balancers. I mean, that's it right there. So we see this uh, with cloud a lot because uh, the cloud you can scale up and bring in uh, not just load balancing. You can also fire up servers as needed for capacity. So to, to really keep that pillar of availability up and running, uh, there's a lot of stuff the cloud has to offer. But also, even non-cloud, uh, let's say you're still running your own data center, load balancers, are they being used uh, across the network in proper locations? And are they secure? So routers, again, layer three routers. Um, routing is definitely going to be a huge part of our traffic. So there's different types of load balancers. Some they're going to do like layer four are going to be transport layer base. Uh, a lot of times you're going to have like a rule of three on here, like round robin. So every other server will get one. Maybe you have five, so three with a, with a backup and then a hot spare, things like that. There's different concepts here with architecture. Um, layer seven, that might be application based. In other words, if um, when that session gets tied to a server, that session always goes to that server. Uh, so there's affinity, other types of stuff. Round robin is probably the most um, common one. Again, uh, being a security professional, you need to be able to have your feet in different parts of areas. You're not going to be the expert, um, or maybe not. You might not be the expert in networking. I know I wasn't working at different places, but I knew how to talk to them and and, and understand uh, they had the proper stuff in place to handle availability, like for failovers. And also, I can talk to them about make sure they have certain things in place for auditing these these devices, uh, whether it be a uh, load balancer or a switch. So, uh, firewalls. <laughs> um, I mean, firewalls. We know firewalls all. They're pretty much straightforward. Uh, the basic firewall is going to be um, looking at just your very, your stateless firewall. So, stateless being, um, you know. We build our firewall out, and so here's our ports. You know, ports 80 open and 443 is open, and so on. Um, and let's say port 22 is not. We keep that one off. So, you now firewall. If I get a hit. If I get a hit <clears throat> for a login for port 22 from a specific IP address, a single IP, it will deny it, right? Bounce it off. Well, let's say they get another one. I'll deny it. They'll deny it. They'll deny it. Well, um, a more of a stateful firewall might see this and say, or like it's more of an intelligent firewall, see this and go, well, I'm getting the same request over time from the same IP address. This looks like an attack, so I'm gonna log an issue to it and maybe block that IP. 
So we'll see later here, files are really gonna become more of intrusion prevention devices also. Uh, especially when you get to more, again, these are you know, larger scale firewalls that are managed. Um, but uh, we know the firewalls need to be in certain locations, right? Uh, definitely maybe here's our DMZ. So between these two firewalls is our DMZ. Uh, we're gonna allow 22 in to our server from internal. Uh, and then from the rest of the world here, we are not, put that cloud there. So firewall placement is very important and not just placement, auditing those firewalls and monitoring the firewalls. So those are the kind of things you can bring up when you look at um, auditing a network. So again, you can see here, <laughs> uh, you have firewalls also on your devices too. So you should not just have a firewall here, um, not just here, we should have firewalls in different layers. Um, probably here, we can have one at the, the, seg the segregation here, maybe one behind, behind the switch. Again, and this is where the architecture comes into play. Um, you wanna be able to make sure you build it in early uh, or else it's gonna cost more money to fix it later. And this goes to a lot of places of security, not just networks, coding, you name it, server design um, and installation. So uh, again, let's go over that. That's just talked about that stateless and stateful. Again, keeps records of the connection, makes decisions based on connection and conditions. <clears throat> so uh, rule-based firewalls, again, more important firewalls in place. Uh, the idea being they're not stack in nature. They can be configured. Application aware firewalls too. So um, AI firewalls are definitely big. Um, if I have a web server status stood up, I will maybe put a firewall, a firewall around it and maybe allow only certain uh, predefined application signatures to come in. So only web traffic can hit my web server from a certain part, uh, uh, vector of my network where maybe from another, another place it can come in. Also payload analysis, uh, what is in my payload coming in. This is again looking at more of a staple based attack. You know, someone's coming with an attack and they're trying to load a, 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 in a, a JPEG that is, that is malicious in nature and trying to load it into maybe a file, a file part that allow JPEG. So um, not only do I want to maybe catch that, uh, deny it on the file load, but also catch it at the firewall. So again, it's that multi-layer security approach. So again, um, next, our next device here is our IDS. Um, biggest thing here is this, IDS doesn't come in all, all forms and fashions. You can get an IDS that um, you might have a network server, a security server maybe. You can install some sort of IDS software. Um, to be honest, what you want to look at IDS is, it could be as simple as something that goes out to the, these switches and routers and firewalls and pulls the logs off them. And it can use open source tool like Spelunk maybe. And it could generate and just parse logs and look for specific conditions and send out alerts and or reports based on those. This could be, again, this could be homegrown. This could be commercial. It could not be beyond software. It could be a rackable device that this thing actually gets traffic put through and that's part of that part of our traffic routing um, inline IDSs and so on passive IDSs the big thing here is you don't want to do any kind of IDS as much as possible I don't want to run web parsing or you know file parsing on these devices I want to move move those files off those log files off and here so IDS and auditing go very hand in hand um, and that's what you can see here out of band in band different types. Biggest thing is this. Yeah, so how it works. Um, and intrusion detection. And here's the big thing right here is, is it anomaly based or is it signature based or behavior based? Anomaly based can be this. So on my network here, um, 
I get specific levels of traffic per day coming in. Maybe of HTTP, um, maybe HTTPS, you know, it's a web server. I mean, I do see a small amount of FTP. Um, so this is, my, this is my user traffic, and I can to take this every day, and with capacity monitoring, I can say, you know, hey, you know, 0 to 24 for the hours of the day, you know, I, this is what we typically see of this traffic type of HTTPS. Um, so, you know, this is our normal peak hours. And this is stuff you want to know, not just for security, but for when we do, when we do up system updates, when, when can we take a system down for one of our, you know, systems off the, off the load balancer to do work. So there's off hours and stuff to look at. Now, not just days of the week, you know, not just what day of the, uh, hours of the day. You can take that and look at Monday through Sunday, what days of the week. So maybe, of course, maybe Monday's, um, shopping days. We do shopping. Maybe the weekends are when we see most of our traffic. And maybe Thursdays and Wednesdays are low. So these statistics are very, very critical, not just for managing your capacity, um, but also monitoring for the oddities to come out. So what if we see a huge spike in HTTP traffic um, during, the, during a time when we don't see it? So you might kick off an alert for that. So, and again, that's looking at, um, looking at anomaly-based, signature-based. Again, we have patterns in place of certain type of traffic types. Again, let's go back to our firewall. You know, a, ma a rash amount of, um, you know, login attempts from the same IP address that fail. Maybe those login attempts have certain um, characteristics about them, you know, like, the first you know, your password was 000 and then 0001 and 999, right? That's like a very pattern based attack. Uh, not just that, we can also look at again, people are signing in um, SQL injection, uh, which you can get uh, cross site scripting. This type of traffic comes in and it can be analyzed. And then we see those signatures and we can block those. Behavior based, again, this is almost like anomaly based. Um, this can be also based on action or program. This is really seen a lot of times on uh, endpoint management. Endpoint being not just antivirus, but maybe anti-malware, anti-ransomware. Uh, before something starts encrypting my files, I'm going to stop it. Um, we also can see this, this sort of behavior we can look at for intrusion uh, de detection and prevention. So, uh, again, we have host IDSs, we have IDS on the hosts, and we have IDS devices. Like I said here, um, we might have I'm on the host, um, off the host, uh, homemade or specific software, on a device with other software, uh, maybe network server, or an actual you know, rackable device, as we saw here, an actual IDS device. Um, these come with costs, of course not just uh, upfront costs, there's uh, ongoing costs, power, cooling, space, I and mean, it could be a monthly fee also for updates for these things. So as you look to bring IDS into a, into a network, uh, realize that there's gonna be ongoing costs for these. It's not a one-time upfront thing. So and that's very important to be able to talk to costs because um, as a security professional, it's good to be able to understand that you don't have all the budget in the world and uh, people who do the budget, right, cut the checks, might say, well, we're going to budget $10,000 for this. You go, well, yeah, but there's an ongoing month, yearly fee of twelve grand, and it's going to be unexpected. So have that information up front and understanding costs can help you with that. Um, IDS host intrusion, I'm going to go over here. Disadvantages, advantages, um, application aware. Again, I think I talked to this already. Okay, IDS IPS. Intrusion detection system. Basically, think of this. It goes through this thing. It sees something go off, and it sends out an email or an alert or some or logs a ticket or or all or one or more of the following things. It does that, and it waits for someone to come and step in and block that IP address or stop that traffic. An IPS will do that and actually block it also, uh, based on the rules. So. Again, um, sometimes uh, people don't like IPSs. 
there's that uh, false positive that can happen and anything that can stop regular flow of production that can be customers ordering stuff uh, that can cost money so uh, IPSs can definitely uh, be something that you need to make sure you test up front really well so and then there's security information management products these SIEMs and again these are rackable costly again usually a rackable device um, or it could be a software suite that runs on a device you might own but it's going to be a third party provided think of it as IPS IDS log monitoring auditing again it's something that um, if security is really of a value this could be uh, just some cost benefit analysis on it um, you know yeah it's great to roll your own you know speedlunk based python parsing but you know it's a lot of money to get it running correctly um, and it might not have everything you need up front where something like this might again it's going to depend upon the security needs but it's going to do something like this and this is great right here this is a really good thing i like to bring this this slide in because um what we see here is a dashboard and I can't say enough about how there's a lot of noise with security. Um, as a security professional, if you can find ways to cut out the noise, that can be whether you can boil down a technical issue, a security issue, down to a, a more consumable format by someone who's not a security professional. It could be a developer, it could be a manager, a you know, CFO, who doesn't have any idea what a cross edge script is. You know, or what a SQL injection is, but they just know that it costs money. Um, same with this. A lot of noise, a lot of auditing, traffic, issues, alerts. Um, these dashboards can be great, and there's ways to do these too, homegrown. But um, what, what open tickets do we have? What unpatched systems are running? What ports are currently uh, opened up and running and allowing traffic through? These dashboards are really going to be a cornerstone for a DevSecOps type of team. And uh, being able to help produce these is going to be good. Understand how we can run them. Again, this you know depends on this is alienvault.com looks like. Um, this is really going to depend upon the manufacturer or the you know the developer of these systems. So um, again, it's going to cost money up front, but it could be of, of great value to have something like this up and running for especially a high security, uh, high resilient type of um, um, institution. So. Architecture. All right, so again, I mentioned before, I mentioned it again here, if I mentioned it, you gotta design it as early as possible. Um, but really more important is creating these network security zones with segregation. So um, have not just be on the DMZ, but also um, we saw DMZs here before, our web servers are broken out from our database application servers with several firewalls here. Uh, so again, you know, we have this DMZ in place we have a way to segregate this traffic. Um, this is of high, high, it's high, very important to be able to do this. Um, untrusted traffic, really to be a high resilient, you should not trust any traffic at all. Make the traffic prove itself. Even if it's coming from an internal, I know a lot of these textbooks are gonna tell you to build out a strong you know, network edge and you should. Network edges should be strong. DMZ should be in place. You know, monitored, managed, smart firewalls. Um, but it used to be you would, as traffic came in, if it was internal traffic, you didn't worry about encrypting it. You left it as is. Um, I know Google's looking at this. Everything, even inside the house, is 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 encrypted. Um, assume someone's listening to your network. And so. Uh, pretty important. So again, uh, use of NATs. I'm not going to go with this. This is some back to a le uh, previous classes you've taken, but to get to my class here, you've already had taken some basic networking stuff, how NAT works, and that's going to change the IPv6, uh, but they are good to have. Um, I'm going to get to this right here is segregation. So just a real quick point here. Um, so yeah, I mean, beyond we have an R external firewall here, which we have a DMZ for. And there we have, of course, web server, email server, the appropriate boxes. 
again, they have another firewall. And this we have our, maybe we have our DevSecOps type of servers, uh, we have our office space and so on. We need to break this down too further. So beyond just to have this ability to sort of um, watch traffic as it comes in, um, inside the ring here, we need to also build out and segregate traffic. So not just maybe front office has its own traffic, its own subnet, uh, of course, our data center should have its own subnet and in itself should have a firewall and a switch controlling who can access this. Maybe only a certain portion of my front office is allowed in through my firewall. So use an IP range, for example, only certain IP addresses, or IP range from an internal IP set. Uh, if I have a guest network with a Wi Fi, definitely want to segregate that, right? I mean, we know. You know, and even them have their own separate firewall and only allowing maybe like 443 and 80, right? Only certain port numbers. It's supposed to be port number there. Um, very important to have that. Don't allow any guests uh, willy nilly access to your regular any network. And also, not just our data center, inside our data center, let's take this even down to a deeper ring here. Our data center itself. Maybe we have um, really critical systems. Maybe we have HVAC in there. We have HVAC systems. We have a set of boxes that help control HVAC, uh, the heating and cooling, not just for our building, but you know, for our data center. So yeah, this is this is critical infrastructure, right? We make sure our servers stay cool. But also we have our things like our payment processing, our PCI compliance servers. You definitely want that to segregate. We don't want HVAC servers talking to PCI. We do not want that. Why, right? <laughs> Always ask why. You know, and so it goes back to um, you know, the needs be need to know, right? So need to access. Uh, and in PCI, maybe our PCI, uh, we have then our HR systems. We don't want those talking to each other. So segregations, as you go deeper down, should really live in there. And your core switching is going to be a huge part of this. Um, switching is a big deal. And then really on top of this is this right here, VLANs. Uh, virtual LANs, again, I don't want to get into this. Um, I never was an expert with VLANs. I, I knew people who were on my team that were. <laughs> so, uh, But it's going to allow to create, to create stand up and, and break down these segregated networks without having to go in and install another switch. So really a, a VLAN capable switch, which you should be, as a large institution should have these, can create this virtually without having to go out and buy a second switch to only have HVAC on and only have PCI on and only have a switch for HR. We can buy two high-end switches so we have a failover and then you know of course we can don't need this switch here. Um, so we have failover capability and we can do all the virtual lines inside there. So let's use some called a tagging protocol uh, let's keep that in mind. And this is from, uh, I don't know if this is in textbook or not, I may have added this, but the target attack, if target was, was properly, uh, was properly uh, segmented, so it looks like based on what this research showed, target hack, target breach um, came from a side channel. So again, we had a vendor here, at the a third party vendor, uh, which needed to have access into our system, into our HVAC, into our data center. So, loop through here. Um, but this is not segregated correctly, or somehow there was a, a channel here. So, they were hacked, which gave them access to our, in this case, I say our, 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 our ZEM, Target's data center. So, um, segregation networks is key. So, uh, data loss prevention. So now, break it down even further. What is the heart of this network? What is the thing we're protecting? Our database, our data, right? Even though I'm looking back at that OSI GIF, um, data is key, right? That is what we want. We want to prevent our data. There's ways to prevent data loss prevention. Um, come called DLP. It can monitor what goes in and out of a, of a uh, company's network and does content inspection. 
And so what we can do is we can look at the content going in and out. So let's say we see um, FTP traffic going out, and that's not uncommon, secure FTP still. Um, so first off, maybe it's going to a destination IP that we're not used to seeing. It's new. I could, I could raise an alarm, or at least raise, you know, maybe not a, a, a block in the IP, but maybe raise an alarm. Um, or maybe we're seeing data copied to a local device. And that data itself, what is this content? Well, let's say if someone's copying, you know, their work schedule or a PowerPoint presentation, that's okay. But let's say they're copying out a database extract that has in it um, sensitive data. So that content inspection uh, could kick off um, an alert and probably, let me clear my screen over here kick off an alert and block that. So again, who, what, when, where, why. <laughs> uh, so DLP agents on network storage, um, network storage and, and an agent in applications um, can ask these questions. Who's requesting it? Where's, you know, where's it stored? Where's it going? You know, what is the data? Things like that. So, and we can build in some, some security with DLP to hopefully block, and this is again, need to plan for um, the exploit to happen, the, the uh, injection to kick off, and the, the, you know, the actual um, data breach to happen. Uh, you want to block that as soon as you can. And this is going to cost money. Yes, it definitely was DLPs going to cost money. But if we can block that data breach, and I know some executives are like, well, no, if I pay all this money, I should have a data breach plan to be hacked. <laughs> so this is huge in defense. It's called resiliency. You want to build in the ability at several layers to be resilient and uh, stop or minimize um, the risk. And the risk of uh, data loss is huge so we can minimize how much data got out. So, so that covers why I think um, the chapter six is important to cover. Um, Again, look over your chapter summary. You probably some details in here I didn't talk about, specifically with uh, the different layers and different types of stuff. Mail gateway monitor, I didn't talk about that. Um, so look it over, and that should fill in some extra stuff uh, that will help you get through things like the quiz. Uh, one last note here: um, if this week's hasn't uh, hasn't changed, you probably hasn't. Um, don't forget, as you do any kind of labs, this in the time of this recording, this was the, this is the lab for this week, which is. Uh, Identify and analyzing a network host intrusion detection system. So, uh, IDS stuff here. Uh, Going to be running a couple of Snorbean, these different uh, tools. Um, don't forget to look at the lab setup. I know it's easy to scroll through this. Most time, lab steps is what? Log into Kali, log in Security Onion, and then go and do it, right? Well, you can see here in Security Onion, we're going to do a sudo service NSM start. Again, this is a terminal command, it's a Linux command, sudo super user, service, service command, service name is NSM, and the command to do it is start, is to start that service. Um, if you don't do these type of steps, it could cause some issues with the lab. So just a note there, I want to bring up during this, this lecture here, I know it's a net labs thing, and these labs could change in the future. So um, if not this lab, any future labs, please be sure, to, just a reminder, always look at any kind of lab setups, no matter what they are and uh, to be sure that you can do their labs properly. So anyways, hope that's it, and that wraps up the topic. Thank you.